architect by trade. Uh, I love to draw, I love to write, and I love to travel, like many of you in the room. So let's see if I can get this started here. I'm going to be talking to you today about, about what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, here we go. Okay. I'm going to be talking to you about uh, travel experiences and the way I document my travels. As I told you, I love to draw. I've loved to draw ever since I was a little kid. This is one of the first comic books I ever drew, Starfighter. And as you can see, as a little kid, I was very influenced by Star Trek and the whole notion of going where no man has gone before. Got to get this right here. Here we go. Um, growing up, uh, my mother was a fine artist. So she had always uh, you know, encouraged us to doodle and draw. Uh, we used to go on a lot of family vacations, uh, load up a station wagon and, and go across the US to all these different destinations. And at one point, I remember uh, counting the number of ways you could actually move people from point A to point B. <laughs> and later on, I went to the university. I studied architecture and environmental design, continuing my, my uh, interest in drawing. After university, I, uh, I basically, like a lot of people did, I went backpacking, uh, traveling by my own, uh, on my own, uh, uh, solo travel. And um, basically, I went on different journeys you know, with no reservations and very little research, which is a great recipe to soak up a culture and basically get into a lot of trouble. Um, and the thing I should point out here is I first started doing this before the age of email, before GPS, before digital cameras. So I became really reliant on either film, which of course was very expensive at the time and very heavy to carry around for a few months at a time, or by sketching and writing. So I opted to really emphasize sketching and writing uh, to document my travels. So as an architect, I traveled as much as I could. I went to all these different historic places that I had studied in school, and actually going to visit these places was incredibly inspiring. Uh, as an architecture student, you're, you're taught to analyze the built environment, and by spending time alone in these places, you can really begin to see how a place was designed uh, and, and dissect it and see uh, how people live there. And of course, when you travel on your own, you have a lot of time on your hands. You know, sometimes you're waiting for a bus, or you're on one of these very long train journeys, so I started drawing all the stuff I was carrying in my backpack. Um, so sometimes I, I do a lot of travel sketches interspersed with ticket stubs. They become like a little scrapbook collection. I'd have some, uh, some notes, uh, some journal entries mixed in there as well. And whenever I'd see a cool little detail, a design detail, I'd just do a quick little sketch to jot it down because this was my way of remembering uh, and to see how something is constructed. In this example here, this was a, a window from Siwa, which is this Egyptian oasis on the Libyan border. And they have these very interesting little windows that are found throughout the, uh, the uh, vernacular architecture there. Um, also, I would uh, combine diary entries with, uh, with different analytical studies. I was always interested in symbology and numerology of different buildings, some of these temples that were you know, oriented towards certain stars and different compass directions. I found all of this very, very exciting and, and interesting, so I would write down everything I could about a place as I learned about it while I was there. I love local tours. You know, going you know, to a place with no reservation, you can just turn up and go on these local tours. This one was a, a tour in Indonesia run by a local guy in his minivan. So he basically took us around to different weaving factories. This was a place that made sarongs and different textiles the old-fashioned way. So they're using uh, you know, hand-operated hand looms and traditional things. And I felt this is something you don't see in a museum in a lot of other countries. And I was really interested to see how, this thing, how these things worked and, and how everything went together. And you know, as, as we get more automated and homogenized, all of this stuff is slowly disappearing. So I figured it's, it's kind of a nice way to remember it, but also save it for posterity to actually see how these things are made. Uh, as an architect, I'm always very interested in seeing how people live. Um, for example, the, the uh, image on the top there, this is a Mongolian uh, gur, which is a yurt, which is basically a super strong, round, portable tent that had been developed over the centuries to suit a nomadic lifestyle. On the bottom, this is a uh, traditional longhouse in Borneo where an entire village lives under run, one roof. And the, the entire building is made from the surrounding rainforest. So the variety of, of different uh, dwellings around the world is just incredible. Um, and of course, when you travel on your own, you're always surrounded by characters. You know? And I started drawing all these people that I would, uh, I would meet on the road and, and, and I'd write a little bit about them. And also, if, for any of you who have traveled alone, you're always thrust into these little ad hoc groups of people. On this case, you know, going on the Inca Trail, you're stuck with this cast of characters for a few days. And so my way of remembering them was basically to do a little thumbnail sketch of them, write a little you know, snazzy thing about them. And look at this guy. He's too tall for the frame. <laughs> um, and then the way I used to write, I was very, very disciplined. So at the end of every day, I would write basically as much as I could remember. I would do a little thumbnail sketch in my mind's eye as things happened, because I, did, I wasn't really documenting it in terms of photography. I'd just do a, a series of thumbnail uh, sketches 
uh, with a little uh, text next to it, and I have these little snazzy headlines like, Search for the Lost Lagoon, Stumbling Through the Mist. <laughs> um, and then, I would also try to do uh, different sketches of, in my mind's eye, how I would remember different places and scenes, like the type of vehicles that we used, or the types of crops that were going there, or the scenery, and, and things like that. Um, one of the things I love about sketching buildings is it's a fantastic way to connect with the locals. Uh, and I'll never forget this incident here. This is uh, Lake Toba in uh, Sumatra, Indonesia. And I found this beautiful uh, Toba attack house uh, alongside the lake. So I planted myself out there, cracked over my sketchbook, and started sketching. And within five minutes, I hear this rustling in the bushes. And I'm soon <laughs> surrounded by a pack of wild children. <laughs> and then within five minutes, they start closing in closer and closer. And I take the rest, I put my pen down. Then they start crowding around my pen. They were convinced the pen was responsible for doing the sketch, not me. <laughs> And then finally, the guy living in the house, he comes out to see what all the commotion's about, and he you know, sees that I'm drawing his house, and he invites me in for the whole afternoon, and so I, I, I connect with the local who's living there, find out all about his culture, all about his customs and traditions, and the environmental issues they're, they're, uh, they're facing there, and, uh, you know, and stepping back, if I had just you know, sauntered past and taken a phone back, I would never have had that, that experience. So these type of things, you know, they lead to these really unexpected uh, pleasantries when you travel. Uh, sometimes I try to geolocate my travel experiences. If, I, if I'm on a certain trail, sometimes I try to tie in an experience uh, in a certain uh, point on the trail. And this is actually useful information, uh, especially when it's a more remote destination, because you'll invariably run into travelers or backpackers coming the same way, you know, about to experience what you just experienced. Then you can actually say, oh, yeah, well, watch out for that trail number nine, you know, washed out from a rainstorm. You know, at least you can give them a heads up of what to expect. Um, and then, I don't know about you guys, but I dread long journeys. You know, long haul flights, long bus trips and things like that. 36 hour bus journey across Sumatra. I mean, I found that like, if I approach it from a documentary perspective and basically recorded the minutia of every little thing that happened on the trip, it's a great way to kill time. And it's a great way to like, have a record of that. Years later, you can flip back through there and you can reflect and say, what was I thinking? Why, why did I even do that trip? Um, and, and as I did more and more of these travel journals, uh, I basically got into a more uh, uh, a regularized storyboard format just to capture my, my experiences that day in, in more of a, a standardized format. So I started doing these little thumbnail sketches with uh, descriptions down below. And of course, after you visit a place, after you, you know, especially if it's a long trip for six, eight, nine months or something, then you get back into the real world, you know, back home with your friends and family. And then you're faced with a dilemma, like how do you share all these travel experiences with people, especially like my inquisitive grandmother. You know, she's like, where did you get, what, what kind of clothes did they wear? Were they nice? What kind of food did they eat? So, you know, inquiring minds want to know. And it was well as my family and friends. Because if you're gone for a long period of time, you have to have some way of disseminating that information. So my solution for that was a little booklet. So basically, I did like a little hand-drawn black and white booklet of some of my thumbnail sketches and, and uh, narrative of the places that I went. So I wouldn't have to repeat the same story a hundred times. So this was basically a very quick hand-drawn thing. Everything was hand-drawn on a single uh, sheet of paper. I basically went down to the corner copy uh, shop and had a couple dozen of these things printed off, staple binding, and I would just distribute it to my friends and family. This is what I did, this is what I did, this is what I did. You know? <laughs> and it was great, you know? And then at the end of the book, I even put in this bogus order form, you know, and then ideas, you know, ideas for uh, other, other little stories that I might want to write, you know? And then one day, orders start to arrive out of the blue. <laughs> For people I didn't even know. The, the very first one I got was this Dutch father. I still have the letter to this day. And he writes, During a trip in Indonesia, I heard from a Swedish guy about your book. Please send me the whole series. <laughs> but the problem was, I hadn't written the other books yet. And I stupidly put, Please allow three to four weeks for delivery. <laughs> so needless to say, the next three to four weeks, I spent night and day printing out the other I mean, they're not going to work, you know, because these people sent me U.S. dollar banknotes in envelopes. Again, this is before PayPal or any of this email stuff. And so I had to make good on the order. So I crank out these books, and then this became kind of like a little side business. These orders started trickling in from all over the world. And, uh, and you know, it wasn't a serious business venture. It just kind of, you know, happened. Uh, and then I decided to really focus on my career, you know, life as an architect. And so this whole, this little travel booklet thing kind of took a backseat. And as any of you know, or are, are, are architects in the audience, it's an extremely grueling career. It's, it takes uh, many, many hours, a lot of perseverance, a lot of hard work, and I really concentrated on my career as an architect. 
Uh, and at one, one, one point in 2008, I read a news clipping about a new hydroelectric dam being built in Borneo. And I soon found that actually this dam was in the same exact location of this longhouse that I visited some years before. And it was soon apparent that this place was going to be lost. It was going to be underwater. So that was the point where I decided, you know, I really want to, I've always wanted to like open this up to a wider audience. That was the time I knew that I really wanted to, to reinvent and, and relaunch this kind of little travel you know, series that I'd come up with uh, to talk about disappearing places, because this place was soon going to be gone. So in 2008, the relaunch. So I basically relaunched the, uh, the book series, and I tried to keep to the original journal format as, as, as best I could. So this is the original for, uh, journal format on the left. This is how the staple booklet lift, uh, looked uh, after my trip. And then this is uh, what you would see in the printed book. Uh, and in the printed book, I also uh, you know, did a lot more research, uh, updated destination facts, uh, basic geographical locations, uh, you know, basically to tell people where in the world this place was, for those who are more geographically inclined. And um, as well, you know, a lot more additional research and uh, doing lots of sketches, little cutaway sections to show how buildings are made, explanatory notes, and things like that. And again, I always uh, reference back to my source material. So these are the sketches I drew when I was uh, actually in the place, you know, that night living in this place, drawing it, and then I developed it into more, uh, you know, kind of cohesive and, and legible illustrations. So basically, this all culminated in the birth of an armchair travel series. And I've been, you know, I've been very, very happy in the last three or four years since this thing has been out. I've received, uh, you know, lots of positive uh, feedback from people all over the world. And I've been very humbled as well to have won uh, a number of uh, international book awards as well. And most of all, I get feedback from different people in the world uh, who are actually, who have been actually inspired to travel to these places that I write about. Uh, and for me, that was, that's the most fulfilling thing of all. So on that note, I will leave you with this final little quote, which I absolutely love. So see the world before you leave it. Thank you very much.